All right. You bear with me so far. We've got about an hour left, and uh, this to me is actually the fun part. I say to me because I'm a masochistic nerd that likes data and workflow and actually managing it, but this is how you actually get a drone to save you all kinds of crazy time and money. Um, I'm going to go into a lot of detail here. Feel free to ask questions, but like I kind of mentioned before, for a lot of companies, not everyone does every single part of this. So I'm going to go through the whole workflow kind of field to finish uh, so that you are at least have a high level of awareness of every single part of this and uh, then you can kind of decide where you want to build it from there. So from a high level, this is what a total kind of drone workflow looks like. It starts with mission planning. Mission planning is kind of like, hey, where am I going to fly? How high? What altitude should I fly at? Things like that. Experienced drone pilots, mission planning takes two minutes because you just know what you're doing. Then data collection. Go out in the field, you fly your drone, obviously shoot all your ground data too, all the stuff that you can't get from the drone. Bring all of your data back in, photogrammetry. That's taking all of those pictures, turning it into a 3D model. Then you need to draft your line look. That's taking this 3D model and turning it into CAD data, points, polylines, layer features, and then finishing it in CAD. And that's putting everything else together, putting in your right of ways, putting your seal on it, uh, submitting your records to the state, as I've heard is very important, so always submit your records. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's kind of what the whole workflow looks like. So we'll go through each one of these in more detail and then uh, you will not have to listen to me anymore. So let's dive in. Mission planning. What is mission planning? Why is it important? Mission planning is asking questions like, is this a good site for drone photogrammetry? Things that we were asking earlier. How much, how much tree coverage is too much tree coverage? Is it legal to fly here? We've talked about that a lot already today too. Just the basic checking of a map to say, all right, is this job site right next to the runway of a major airport, or is it in the middle of nowhere and I'm good to fly? What altitude should I fly at? We talked about that a little bit too. 30 feet, too low. 100 foot, 200 foot, 400 feet. All reasonable, it depends on the job site. What's the appropriate overlap in terms of how close, like where the drone should fly? How much, how many ground control points, GCPs or what we call those, should I set? Where should I set them? How should I arrange the flight pattern? And what data still need to be ground surveyed? Um, so why ask these questions? Well, number one is it saves you time. This is one of those things where five minutes of planning saves you hours and hours and hours and hours of work down the line. I'm sure you've heard that plenty in all types of other different things that take your five minutes before you go in the, go in the truck and just go through like a packing checklist, right? To make sure you don't forget any antennas and then you're three miles away, or three hours away. Um, so it saves field time and it also saves huge amounts of office time. Just a little bit of good mission planning saves you a lot of time. Best way to do this is, um, so before you fly, you need your Part 107 license that we've already talked about. Check your airspace restrictions, obtain authority to fly. Overall, we actually use a checklist. If you want a checklist, that's one of the many things that, uh, we're happy, that we give away for free. So if you want to shoot me an email afterwards, we're happy to with our drone surveying checklist. Just the basic things, because that's, um, <coughs> like I said, the packing checklist to me is the most important thing. Uh, not because you don't know how to pack something, but because Anyone that's ever been a couple hours away from the office when they realize they've forgotten the dumbest little thing, it's the worst feeling in the world. And it took me one time, like being out at the site, it was really remote, and I didn't have the damn memory card. That little piece of plastic the size of your friggin' pinky nail cost me like six hours, and I just hated it. So if, if I save one person from making that mistake because they use a checklist, then that's totally worth it. Um, so just going through those basic checklists of kind of knowing that information. Uh, but start with your requirements. Every job site has different requirements, as we've discussed. Every job is totally different. What is an average job doesn't really exist. Every job is its own thing. So one of the things that we always start with is what accuracy do you need? And the, the most infuriating answer that I ever get is, well, as good as you could possibly get. Because, well, then you better call NASA and get like one of their particle accelerators that cost a billion dollars and they can measure a width of an atom or something. That's the best you can get, but of course you don't need that for survey. Everything has an accuracy tolerance that you need. Everything. Whether it's a couple hundreds of a feet, a tenth of a foot, half a foot, one foot contours. Maybe you're working really up far out there in the sticks and you need ten foot contours or something. Uh, knowing, you got to start with what your accuracy requirements are, because the tighter your tolerance is, the more time it's going to take, the more expensive the equipment's going to take, and uh, like the more money it is. So 
general rule of thumb is this is a good table that we use. If you fly at 100 feet above ground, you can get a tenth of a foot, both horizontal and vertical, and you can cover about five acres per battery. If you fly at 400 feet, you can cover 50 acres per battery, so you're covering 10 times as much ground in the same amount of time. Uh, but you're getting about four tenths vertical, three tenths horizontal. Typically, being fully honest, it's actually a lot better than that. Um, but those are kind of the worst case scenarios that we give. Now that, you know, four tenths vertical, that's plenty if you need one foot contours over a couple hundred acres. But if you need, you know, if you're doing mostly hard state, typically 400 feet is gonna be too high then. You have tighter tolerances than that. But that's where you start with. And when people ask about flying, what's the right altitude to fly at? This is where I tell them to start and use this as a rule of thumb. Because of this, as you can probably guess, the vast majority of jobs that we see are gonna be right around you know, 150 to 200 feet flight altitude. That's really kind of the good Goldilocks zone. 400 feet is reserved for if you are doing enormous amounts of area and all you gotta do is kind of rough topo. 100 feet is if you need really, really accurate um, you know, locations on curves. You need to be able to draw multiple curve lines. You need utilities, everything down to better than a tenth of a foot. Some more flight plan best practices. One, we recommend a lawnmower flight pattern. That's kind of like you'd see here. Drone just autopilot flies back and forth. Um, haven't really talked much about autopilot technology today because quite frankly, it's really boring and it's really reliable. Uh, there are dozens of apps out there, some that you can just download one. You really just draw an area on your phone, set your flight altitude and hit fly and the thing does itself. You do not need to be a manual pilot in order to be a drone surveyor whatsoever. You can be, it's fun to be a manual pilot, but you don't need to be. Um, you really, in most normal missions, it's kind of boring. It's really become less of a toy and more of a tool, which is what we kind of want for this type of thing for work. You draw it out and you hit go. Overlap, these are things that for a photogrammetrist really matters. Uh, if you're just a pilot, it doesn't really matter too much. 75, 75 is just how close those flight lines are to one another. You increase those numbers, the flight lines get closer together, you start taking a lot of data. Um, and lastly, only Nittier only, that means when you're taking photos, the camera should be pointing straight down. When it takes multiple photos next to each other, there's overlap between those. That's how you triangulate it, or that's how the photogrammetrist will triangulate it into 3D data. Lastly, or also on uh, the flight planning best practices, there is such a thing as too much data. A common mistake that I see in people, especially as they're new with drone surveying, is like, let's just, let's just get a lot more data because that way if we screw something up, it'll fix it. But that's typically not the case. Gathering more data, well, one means more time in the field, but it also means longer processing times, larger, more cumbersome files, and it doesn't often actually fix any of the mistakes that you make. In some cases, it can make things worse. Um, so the solution is generally fly higher. It's a little counterintuitive, but flying higher means less data and everything actually processes a lot faster. You really, you can sometimes get better data by flying higher. For the same principles we talked about with that flying at 30 feet, you actually get better data at 100 feet. That actually is kind of true even going up. Sometimes you can get better data higher up because you can set less control, set fewer control points as you fly higher. Um, so don't go crazy with the overlap. This there is such things too much data uh, because you know processing and time isn't free. All right. So now talking a little bit more about mission planning, um, planning ground control points and checkpoints. So we talked about ground control points. For anyone that's familiar with either drone photogrammetry or traditional aerial photogrammetry, uh, ground control points are a must. Now, a lot of hardware people will give a sales pitch that I don't really like that says, this bird has RTK on it, you don't need ground control. For a surveyor, that's just crazy. Um, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely every site should have a, at least some control, because you've got to tie into something. Ground control there is to make sure that the aerial data ties in with everything else on the site. I mean, heck, I, I come from, ooh, I don't know if I should admit this because everyone didn't like it in the last presentation. I'm from California too. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but where I live, the land moves about a tenth of a foot every year. So you've always got to localize your site. Always, always, always. Um, so anytime you have to have at least one thing that you're tying into. That's just good practice for us. 
Um, so always set ground control points, and there are some best practices for ground control points. Good rule of thumb for us with ground control points, set five targets per battery, four in the corner, one in the middle. We've got a very just kind of boring square site over here with four, five ground control points, four in the corner, one in the center, with some flights, uh, some pictures on the outside and inside, and they're visible from all angles. That's kind of a really, really simple version of what ground control points look like. As far as how many ground control points you need total, the accuracy spec determines how much you need. So as I was talking about, the higher you fly, the less control you need. If you fly at 400 foot above ground, you only need five targets for every 50 acres. One target for 10 acres. Not bad, that doesn't take all that long. If you fly at 100 feet a lot lower, you need five targets every five acres, so one per acre. So the lower you fly, the more control you have to set to get that better accuracy. So to really save time, it actually does help to fly higher whenever you can, because it's saving you a lot of, uh, a lot of time in the field. Any questions on this for people that, uh, that fly such so GCPs or anything? I was just curious, <laughs> once you fit your height, does that have to stay constant? Um, it's best to keep it relatively the same. It doesn't need to be perfect. Like if the hills, if the hills come up, if it, the altitude of the site changes by 50, 80 feet or something, it probably won't make that much of a difference. Um, if there are enormous changes, sometimes it might help to, uh, they have technology called terrain awareness, where the drone more or less tracks the terrain so that it always stays a constant, call it 200 feet above ground. That can help if you're working on sites that have a lot of elevation change. When I say a lot of elevation change, I mean more than about 50 or 100 feet on a single project site. That's when you need to start thinking about it. Uh, we got some questions about here? Sure. Oh, I was just the five target thing. It's funny that it doesn't increase with the more acreage. Well, it does. You think you need more targets. Yeah, so this is, that's for the different flight altitudes. So if you were doing 10 acres at 100 feet, you would need 10 ground control points. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the, the larger the site, the more ground control points you need. Or you can fly higher instead, and then you can set fewer. There's, I know it's a little complicated. That's why there are all these, okay. these trade-offs with this type of thing. Now, there is kind of one glitch with this too, not glitch, but one way around it. And that's RTK, PPK data. As I talked about, uh, the, the latest and greatest drones that are out there have onboard RTK or PPK corrections, dual band GPS antennas. Um, and that dramatically reduces the amount of checkpoints that you need. Um, we've actually done sites where we'll do a couple hundred acres with only two or three control points to actually tie it into the, uh, the local coordinate system. And uh, it's perfectly accurate, like accurate to a couple of tenths. Um, because it has that onboard RTK, PPK stuff. So that, it's taken a while to get that technology to maturity and it's absolutely there now. We love RT, we love onboard RTK, it's such a good <coughs> check. Um, for a lot of surveyors too, RTK data is a good kind of just like backup data, right? In case one of your other pieces of equipment fails or, you know, we've, I'm sure you've all seen more different types of errors than I have. Anything from you set the rod height wrong at one point, you got a bad signal, you're, someone kicked your base station and you didn't even know it. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with surveying. Having that just additional source of backup data with an onboard RTK is really, really cool as far as the, uh, the hardware goes and really reduces the amount of ground control and checkpoints that you need. So that's kind of mission planning. Any questions on uh, mission planning? Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's um, base station management is, with drones really is another one of those things that I say is project dependent. That's almost what we're talking about offline. Because it depends on exactly what hardware setup you're using. Phantom 4 RPK being the most common, but even then there are two different ways to use it. You can use your own base station, Trimble R10, Leica, GS16, whatever, if you're using your own base station, or you can use DJI's base station. Different workflows for each of those, both possible though. How much range are you doing? Are you just moving it every mile, every half mile, every 10 miles? That changes it as well. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can process RTK data. For anyone in here that does a lot of you know, GPS post-processing work, you know there are a lot of different workflows for it. 
So it's kind of site specific. It's site and equipment specific. Hang on, which one did it? Six, it's a six mile project. Six, six mile, mile project? project. Um, yeah, you could get away without moving the base, or you could move the base and just as long as you have a tie plane between them, <laughs> then that's to, to tie it in and that's fine. Can you tie into the WSRN with this? Yes, however, there, there are um, a couple of caveats with that. My, in my personal experience, those are a more complicated workflow as, so when you're tying into a correction network, you need live streaming data while the drone's flying. Now, if you're on the ground and you lose connection for about a second, that doesn't matter that much, or maybe a couple of seconds because you can reshoot the point or you can just wait and have a longer occupy time. But the drone is flying, and the drone's moving fast. And if you lose five seconds of data, that's about 100 feet worth of data. Um, so it needs to be a really good internet connection, a really stable internet connection to use it live in the field. What I typically like, if you are going to use some sort of network correction, is do the, the processing in post. You can post process all of your uh, GNSS data, then you don't need a live internet connection. It's a much more robust solution because it, there's no radius signal to fail. It's just collecting everything locally. You post process all the GNSS and it's very reliable there. So those are the caveats. My personal preference, I think the local base station is the most, is the best combination of easy, reliable, and accurate. Um, but yes, you can use any sort of network-based solution, whether it be the state one, or if you're using some sort of other, you know, Trimble, Carlson, Leica, they all have all their own various VRS networks and whatnot, but those do work as well. All right, so let's talk about uh, field data. First thing that I wanna talk about is important to me. As, as a photogrammetrist myself, I spend a lot of time looking at ground control so it's important to mark good ground control points. Now, drone ground control is easy because we're, we're so much closer to the ground. It's not like traditional aerial targets where you set this massive like eight foot by eight foot thing and you need like 10 nails to set it down. You can use things like a you know, 12 foot or 12 inch by 12 inch kitchen tile, like something pretty easy. But a lot of them aren't very good. We see people that do everything from uh, just a plain white square. You can't really see the center point too, obviously. Visual ID points where someone will say, yeah, it's the, uh, the end of a paint stripe in the middle of a parking lot with 100 paint stripes and the photogram just has no clue which one. Chevrons are, okay, are really awful for photogrammetrists because some surveyors will mark the front tip of the chevron, some will mark the inside corner, some will mark the center of the chevron between the front tip and the inside corner, and the only consistent thing that I've seen is that every surveyor thinks that the way they do it is the way that absolutely every other surveyor ought to do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so we don't like chevrons for that reason. Another one that I actually wish I had seen more of. <laughs> I complain, but honestly, if you do that, yeah, go ahead. It's worth it just because it's fun. Um, so those are not generally recommended. Clear tiles like this, these are ones that we even sell tiles, like disposable ground control points that buy the grade that are kind of cool. But um, they don't have to use ours. Any cross hatch pattern, anything like that, with a very, very clear center point um, is really what you want to use for ground control. Another thing when, with your field data uh, collection, standard operating procedures. I'm sure you guys have lots of standard operating procedures and there's a reason behind it. It makes it repeatable, it makes it easy, it makes it reliable. You just kind of go out, you get used to it, and you know the data that you're gonna get. Best way to get standard operating procedures and repeatabilities, like I said, is checklists. Checklists are fantastic because they, they're not there to teach you what to do. You guys are smart enough people, you know what you're supposed to do. They're there to prevent you from making those dumb mistakes. Those little dumb mistakes of just doing things out of order that then you do a flight and you realize you forgot to take the lens cover off because you didn't even check for it. And your camera was black the whole time and you should have just looked down, you could have seen it at any point, but you just didn't because you forgot to. We see that all the time and it's not, most of this isn't mission critical. You're not gonna kill someone if you leave your lens cap on. It's just, this is how you save time. This is how you make it really reliable. You just kind of boring, look through, yep, did that, yep, did that. Oh shoot, forgot the lens cap. All right, and you're good to go. Takes two seconds. Checklists are the best thing when it comes to just standard good field operations. Again, we give all of our checklists out for free. Let me know if you want one and we'll happily get one to you. So what's on an operations workflow? 
Check the site for restrictions, airspace, instructions, flight restrictions, anything like that. Check the weather forecast too. It takes two seconds. You probably know what it is, but if you're driving to a site two hours away and it's going to be just, you know, absolute miserable sleet, then no, that's not the right day to fly a drone. Wait until tomorrow, or if you really need your data, then have fun being outside in that weather. Um, Crete and saving your flight plans, packing your equipment, uh, setting up your ground station, all of your go through your aircraft inspection. And then you gotta survey your ground data. Ground control points and checkpoints, the ones that you uh, that you set for the drone to see, as well as any obstructed areas, and usually this is when people are also gonna shoot all the rest of their data on the ground. Doesn't always have to be in that order. Depending on uh, how your workflow goes, some clients will set all of their control one day, and they'll go fly a day or a couple of days later. Some people will set their control and fly, and they won't shoot it until a couple of weeks later or something, because they've set their control and they'll just shoot it with everything else that they need. Honestly, either of those is fine. As long as the control point is visible when the drone flies, you can shoot it before or after whatever is most convenient to you. And all the other stuff that you gotta shoot. Like I said, drone, drone can only uh, map what it can see, so if you've got a monument that's buried and nothing visible on top, you are not going to be able to locate that from the air. Other things, just going through basic emergency procedures check. You just kind of load your operation. Running an operation, you, you notice at no point if I talk today about like, oh, here's how to fly a drone. That is again because it's so stupidly easy. It really is you push the green fly button and it flies. You do not need to know how to fly a drone to do anything that I'm talking about. It's remarkable how easy it is to fly a drone. Uh, and lastly, data handling procedures. This is again just good data practice so that you don't lose that dumb tiny SD card. If you couldn't tell, I don't like SD cards. They're too easy to lose. Uh, um, all right, and like I said, you do have to collect all of the data in the field that the drone can't. That typically means boundaries. I'm not 100% sure in Washington State I should check, but I believe boundary legally cannot be for, uh, surveyed from the air. The boundary must be done on the ground. I know if you're doing an ALTA survey, ALTA surveys also require that boundary must be surveyed on the ground, cannot be done from an aerial survey. Building corners, typically people like doing those on the ground. Um, that is not legally required, depending on the survey. Uh, monuments need to be done on the ground. ADA compliant stuff, again, typically. Obscured areas with trees and anything where you need very, very high accuracy is typically going to be done on the ground. That seems like a lot, but one of the things that I like to say with a, with a typical workflow is if you're doing, call it, you know, a 15 acre office complex or something that has a couple of buildings on it and maybe 500 parking stalls, you could go out, you could shoot the, you know, 20 building corners and then use the drone for all of the topo work and the 400 plus parking stalls, and you would save yourself an enormous amount of time because the parking stripe does not have the same level of accuracy required as a building corner or a wheelchair ramp does. And all your topo data you can typically get with the drone as well. And then you walk the boundary, and that's kind of that's the type of mixed workflow that people really get used to once they start doing these surveys a lot. And once you kind of get used to all of that, man, it just really it takes most of the a lot of the most tedious work out of the uh, the field work. Any questions on what you can or can't get from a, from a drone or anything like that? All right, so moving along to the office workflow next. So the office workflow is everything from there. You've collected your data, now you're back in the office, working in CAD typically. Most people, uh, the most common that we see is people are gonna do a lot of this stuff in Civil 3D towards the end. That's what I'm most familiar with myself, but all of these workflows support Carlson, Trimble Business Center, Bentley Microstation, like literally any of these software they call together. But let's talk about uh, what I mean. So probably a lot of you guys aren't familiar with exactly what I mean by photogrammetry, drafting line work, and then finishing in CAD. So let's talk about it. I go back to this kind of drone surveying journey that I mentioned earlier that is how do you get from basic photos and videos to ortho photos? That's typically photogrammetry. Extracting data, actually extracting your topo points and your line work, that's kind of line work. And then CAD finishing is where you put it all together into an actual final deliverable. So photogrammetry is where you stitch the individual photos. You have a whole bunch of photos. A typical drone uh, project might take anywhere from 100 to a couple thousand photos is pretty <coughs> common. Uh, it takes individual photos, merges them with the ground control, 
and turns it into a 3D data uh, format, typically in the form of a point cloud, an ortho photo, and a digital surface model. Line work is the process of reducing that rich 3D model. That rich 3D model, when drone photogrammetrists do this, is enormously detailed. It has 3D locations of every single leaf on every plant, of every person that was there, of every dog, of every car, all kinds of stuff that you do not want and you do not care about and, you, and should not show up in the survey. So you have to clean that. You have to draw your curb lines, you have to draw, take your topo points, you have to draw your sidewalks, you have to locate your utilities. And then you put it all together in CAD. And that means merging in your field shots, creating a tin surface, adding culture, adding annotations, adding all of the uh, property records, things that you pulled from you know, underground utilities, whatever, putting it all together into your final delivery. So let me kind of sum this up a little bit. This is a chart that really kind of puts it all together. You start with photos, ground control, RTK data, RTK or PPK data. You manage all of that through a process that is called photogrammetry. That turns it into an ortho photo, a surface model, and a point cloud. Then you go through your line work drafting. That's extracting the valuable data. Uh, and that gets you your 3D, pop, 3D points, polylines, typically in a DXF file format. And then you go through your CAD finishing, and that gets you your final deliverable, typically DWG, again, that's AutoCAD. Uh, with all of your culture, all of your surface, all of your contours, all of that sort of thing, and that's your final deliverable. Um, minor, you know, selling myself a little bit. All of this stuff is what my company does. But uh, not a sales pitch, this is more just uh, going through the technology. So this all makes sense from a high level? Cool. So let's actually dive into it now. The technology, like the science behind photogrammetry. So what is photogrammetry? Photogrammetry by itself is the art and science of making measurements from photographs. So that really is, you know, just land surveying with photographs, land surveying from the air. It's creating the 3D data from the 2D photos, and the output of this is a rich 3D model. So there's kind of a picture. That shows what some of the photos look like looking down. This is an open pit mine and then color-coded with elevations. So this is what a rich 3D model can often look like. You can see this one has some automated contours put on there, but it has everything, including a whole bunch of equipment up here where it actually has contours drawn around all of the cars and tractors, as well as pretty jagged contour lines because it's going around everything, ev absolutely everything that it sees. So when we process photogrammetry, we say, you know, work harder, not, or smarter, not harder. It's an iterative process, human in the loop, parallel processing. These are just some of the things that we do. If you can't read this, you kind of, Basically, you start with your photos, you start going through a process, and you run QA, QC on it, integrate your ground control points, more QA, QC. And if it's not where you want, you kind of keep processing it. So what a lot of people that are doing this probably want to know is, OK, well, what software do you use? What settings? And that sort of thing. So we're, we use a software called Pix4D. Um, they are the market leader in photogrammetry software. For people that uh, work with drones already, probably are familiar with it. Others have probably heard about it. It's a fantastic software, but like a lot of softwares, it's only as powerful as the person that's using it. It's not a black box, throw data at it and everything works totally fine, but it's a really powerful photogrammetry software. As far as what hardware do you need, uh, it is a pretty computationally heavy process, <coughs> the process of photogrammetry. Up there, just the specs for computer geeks about what, uh, what most of our processing servers look like. Um, you can do more or less. That's a good kind of Goldilocks zone for us. And then the other thing I mentioned on here uh, for our kind of photogrammetry processing uh, procedures is ASPRS, the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. That is for anyone that's interested in learning more about photogrammetry. That's a really awesome resource to, uh, to look at. They're the ones that actually certify a lot of photogrammetrists all over the country. As mentioned, I'm certified myself. Uh, so that's actually a really good thing if anyone is interested in learning more about photogrammetry. So using photogrammetry software correctly, there are no magic settings that you can fly your drone, take pictures, throw it at a black box, and just ta-da, you now have a perfect tenth of a foot accuracy survey. If you only care about 20 foot of accuracy or something, then yeah, that's usually the case where you can throw it at software without any sort of QA QC. But it really takes uh, a standardized workflow, all the principles that I've already been talking about, right? Standardized workflow, integrating your checkpoints, checking for errors, 
adjust your settings based on the side, and learn, like getting trained on photogrammetry will all help you to use uh, the photogrammetry software correctly so that when you do actually manage all of your data, um, put it all together, you know that your outputs are actually going to be right. This is survey. You guys can't have like, you know, 85% of my points are good, so I, I pass, right? I get a B, so no, you need, you need a little bit more than that. Reliability is important. QA, QC is important. Um, it's actually this step that unfortunately has really soured a lot of people uh, on the overall concept of drone surveying. Um, about two or three years ago, when drone surveying first started becoming more popular, there were a lot of people that went out and said, ah, here there's money in surveying. They had a drone, they flew a site, and then they gave someone a picture and called it a survey and had no freaking clue about the principles of accuracy or anything like that. And a lot of surveyors hired them, thinking that this was gonna be the next great thing. And then they got burned because they spent, you know, sometimes thousands of dollars on some kid with the drone that had no freaking clue what he was doing. And it was off by 20 feet, and then they got behind on a project and they got chewed out or something like that. So that actually scared a lot of people from drone surveying in general. Uh, and it actually scared a lot of states too. Thankfully, for the reason I'm here, Washington is a great state that actually supports this sort of, this type of thing uh, in a responsible manner. It does not just like a knee-jerk ban everything, which a couple of states have actually done their best to ban drone surveying because they're, they're afraid that someone's gonna screw it up. So using the software correctly, that's really the most important point. And to fix a problem, like to, to be able to use the software correctly, the first thing that you have to do is be able to realize that there is a problem in your QA, QC step. That's really the hardest part too. When you don't realize there's a problem, you don't have anything to fix and you don't know how to fix it. And that's again where that kind of photo, photogrammetry training comes in, is being able to identify errors. Because if you're looking at a photogrammetry model, three tenths of a foot in a photo that was taken from 400 feet away is absolutely invisible to the human eye. Heck, I mean, a five foot error would be nearly invisible to the human eye from a photo like that. So being able to, uh, to figure out there is a problem, figure out, uh, figure out what caused the problem so you can prevent it next time, and then fixing it is really important. So let's talk about identifying errors in photogrammetry. Most photogrammetry software will put out a quality report. I'm gonna focus on the PIX4D e quality report for a little bit today, just because again, that's the most common. Um, but also using check shots. This is another one of those principles that hopefully most of you guys are already pretty comfortable with. If you ever work with even another survey crew, even some of your colleagues, check their data. It's often wrong. Um, so using check shots, whenever you work with a photogrammetrist or whether they're in your office or you hire someone out, always use check shots. Take a couple of shots extra in the field, even if it's just like topo shots that you hold back so that when you get kind of final data from them, you can just verify and make sure everything ties out. That's really, really, really a valuable way to, uh, to ensure data integrity and also just make sure that it, it's a really good kind of CYA move too to make sure that you just validate everything so that if someone makes a mistake, you're the one to catch it. You don't want to be the one uh, caught holding the bag when you, whenever there's a mistake made somewhere in the, uh, in the system. And lastly, just experience. Work with this stuff uh, a lot, it's really helpful. So this is what a PIX40 quality report looks like for uh, anyone that's never seen it. These are parts of it. Um, they have kind of an automated quality report thing at the top here uh, that gives you some simple like, places to start. Green checkbox means everything looks good. Yellow or red means that there's going to be an error. But uh, part of the reason I bring this up is it can be really misleading at times. One of the things I don't think you can probably see it too well, but it has, on this project, there's, it says that there were eight ground control points with a mean error of three thousandths of the survey foot. To which I would say, wow, three thousandths, great accuracy, you did good, a good job. But for any surveyor that knows three thousandths of a foot accuracy is just not possible. You can't actually get three thousandths of a foot accuracy with any tool out there, Heck, even a total station, I mean, just, you use, a survey rod once and the amount of metal that gets worn off the bottom is practically three thousandths of a foot. Um, so being able to kind of interpret those results, the difference between ground control points and checkpoints uh, is fairly meaningful. Here is some of the individual ground control point analysis and here's what a project looks like. This, to give some context, each one of these kind of green uh, and yellow dots 
is an individual photo, the drone's flying back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and this is how many connections are in between the photos. So this is a, a chart that I like to analyze when looking at these things too, it's saying, oh, you can see all of the photos matched uh, really well over here, but there weren't a lot of matches between these photos. Why is that? There might be an error on the site, right? And this is where a photogrammetrist would look at that and say, okay, well, let's actually start looking at the pictures and seeing if there's something wrong. Sure enough, I remember on this project site, that was just a lake. You can't survey the top of a lake, it's constantly moving, so that's why there are no matches. It's all just water feature. Whereas this is where all of the, uh, the hardscape and all the land was, and that matched all fine, so that's actually good. That's a good way to just check for errors. But keeping an eye out and kind of having that mentality of like, you want to QA, QC things. You want to look for errors. And that will, uh, will help keep a very high quality um, overall workflow that will make sure that you don't ever let those errors sneak through. Any questions on that? I know that can get pretty technical with this sort of thing. I don't want to get bogged down too much in that. All right, checkpoints. Already talked about those. Checkpoints really are the best way. This really, I can't get over this enough. This applies to much beyond just like drone surveying too. Any type of aerial surveying, any time you are working with anybody else, having a couple of checkpoints just to validate data, ensure your tools are, ensure all of your equipment is good work, in good working condition. Uh, checkpoints really, really, really help. They should be measured independently. They cannot be used in photogrammetry. And if you're really following the rules, should be very, should be evenly distributed around the sites. Make sense? Cool. The best way to talk about checkpoints and data, I've already given them one plug, ASPRS, uh, it's a nonprofit uh, educational organization that uh, is really just dedicated to the science of photogrammetry, making sure that this technology works, that it's used responsibly, that it's used accurately. Because really it's super powerful if it's used uh, responsibly and accurately, so I always like to give them a plug, they're a really great organization. And lastly is managing processing time. So. A lot of, we're talking about the office workflow here, but you, most of uh, the impact on processing time comes from how you collect data in the field. We already talked about all the field workflow stuff, which is how high you fly, what's your overlap settings, that sort of thing. That really is what impacts the processing time. Now processing time is where a lot of people will get bogged down too, right? They'll say, oh, I flew the drone, took me half an hour to do a mile of corridor or whatever. Great, awesome, I saved a bunch of time. Then they'll go back in the office and it'll take them three or four or five days to process something. And that's not really saving you much time if you're only, if you're spending five days in the office in order to save one day in the field. That's not really a good trade-off. So you gotta, you gotta think about this, manage your processing time effectively. So it starts with good mission planning. As I mentioned, there is such a thing as too much data. If you gather twice amount, the amount of data, that's probably gonna mean twice or even more uh, time in the office. Um, in fact, for the pure, pure processing time, it's non-linear. You double the amount of photos, it quadruples the processing time. You quadruple the amount of photos, it's 16 times the amount of processing time. So solutions with all of this, a good workflow is worth a lot more than a good computer. Um, I know you guys are probably working with different budgets than when I talk to engineers. Typically engineers, it's something that I've always liked about them. Whenever they have a problem, they just want to throw more money at it and make it disappear. At least with, uh, with like That's a credit. Right. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Poor California. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, it doesn't work. Uh, and like that, it doesn't work here too. Um, no, we, we have very much found that throwing money and throwing like the higher end computers at the problem does not solve the problem at all. Um, I deserve it. <laughs> so yeah, staging your processing, getting more, getting more efficient. Like, that's why I, I wish I could tell that to, to, well, to politicians too. Don't spend more money, do it right the first time. Um, so yeah, do it right the first time, good workflow, follow good procedures, and you can get really, really good data, um, and you really don't need to spend a ton of money on this, on this stuff as well. You can if you want to. I have seen companies that are half a million dollars deep into their drone program and getting just crap data out of it too, because they have such bad workflows and they just kept buying and chasing, you know, 
throwing more money after, after that. But. So, manage your processing time with a good workflow. Put that all together and you do save crazy amounts of time. But at the end of it all, photogrammetry is hard. I really wish that I were good enough that a 15, you know, 20 minute segment of a presentation could get everyone up to speed on photogrammetry, but that's just not the case. This is a science, it takes a lot of practice. My typical recommendation is, you know, either really start learning about it with ASPRS or work with someone who knows about it. You, I, that's how we work with most of our clients is kind of, we're the, the hired guns of photogrammetry and they're the surveyors and we like that. We're photogrammetrists, that's just what we do. So the next step, after photogrammetry, or actually I'll, I'll do one last pause and see if there are any other questions on photogrammetry even from a high level. I know it's a really, really deep kind of mathematically based science. All right, next up is line work drafting. This is something that's gonna be a bit more familiar to you guys, but uh, I should actually probably start with definitions too. Line work is another one of those words that different surveyors kind of interpret it in different ways. Some people think it means um, all of the points and polylines. Some people think it only might mean 2D planimetric features. Some people might think that everything that is photogrammetry is also part of line work. So this is kind of our distinction is that photogrammetry gets you to that full resolution orthophoto and line work drafting is when you reduce it into a rich CAD friendly surface. For anyone that's dealt in software with a point cloud before, you know that that's a just miserable file format. It's really rich data. It has a lot of good information, but it's awful, awful, awful to work with because there's just so much noise. Whereas you work with a nice surveyor's file, you'll actually have curve lines. They're all going to be in the right layer templates. They're gonna be color coded. You can turn them on and off. You have your topo points, your tin surfaces. Creating all of that stuff together is what we call the process of line work drafting. You can tell me I'm wrong and I, won't listen to you on that one because uh, we've heard too many different definitions. But that's that's just what we call it at least, is line work graph. So why do you need to do this? Why can't you just take the raw photogrammetry outputs and say go with that? Well, typically the files are too big. There's too much data you don't need, like the elevations of all of the tops of the trees, the elevations of bushes, all of the cars that are parked there and what color they were, that's all integrated in all of that data. And also they're typically going to be parked over the data that you do care about, which is the actual roadway <laughs> service. Um, and on the data that you do need, it's ugly. The contours are going to be jagged. There's artifacts in the data too. Digital data very frequently has artifacts where it's a road and then all of a sudden there's a spike in the digital data that's not there in real life. That's very common, you need to just kind of smooth that out. So this is what kind of automated contours look like when they're raw out of a uh, photogrammetry software. And again, it draws contours over all of the equipment and stuff that's there that you really, really don't need. So there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. You have your rich data, your rich 3D data, um, and the first way to do it is automated software analysis. There are a number of softwares out there that are really cheap, and like I said, will generate these automated contours. They'll maybe do their best to try and filter out trees or classify the point cloud or something like this. But typically it's inaccurate, huge amount of QAQC required. Um, it may work for a lot of, I know there are a lot of like uh, earth moving companies that will use this software because all they care about is how many cubic yards of dirt did I move today and if I'm off by 10% and close enough. Like they're, if, if you're that type of company, great, you can use an automated software. Typically that's not uh, good enough for, for survey. And then in-house drafting and higher drafting firm, these are really the two options for surveyors. In-house drafting, you use your own people, basically sit there and you kind of draw on a 3D model. Um, a lot of you guys probably have drafters that you work with that can actually draw on this data, just extract the valuable data. It's a tedious manual process, but a lot of times that's, you have a lot of control over the process and that's how you get really good data. Or there are a number of firms out there, again, we are one of them, where you can hire a, out a firm that will actually help take that you know, huge photogrammetry files and turn them into uh, clean drafted line work. <coughs> so I say like, just draft line work. How do I do this? What, what do I mean by that? What are the methods of line work drafting? One way is to draft on individual photos. This is kind of how uh, really old school photogrammetrists used to do it. If you've ever seen you know, a big stereo plotter, you have your two photos in there, you're identifying the same point on each two photos in the stereo plotter, and boom, that's your point. You can actually still do that. There are digital equivalents of that. 
It's very, very time consuming, but it's also really accurate because you're you know, manually marking every single point. It takes a lot of time though. You can also draft directly on the ortho photo. Some people take the big ortho photo, import it into a GIS program of some form, and just start drawing lines on it. That's really quite good. It'll get you good 2D data. So depending on what software you use, it can have 3D data as well. But you're really just kind of drawing your curve lines, drawing your paint striping on top of the photo. And if you did all of your photogrammetry processing right, it's going to be perfectly accurate, you know, tenth of a foot or so. Uh, there's point cloud drafting. For anyone that has worked with large LiDAR data sets, this is exactly the same thing. You're going in, you're extracting individual points, connecting them, putting them together. Uh, and then there's a DSM ortho photo drafting model that a couple of softwares are now starting to use, where you actually use a 2.5D surface model which pretty much means that for any one x, y point, there's only a single z elevation. Um, it's a much easier way to actually draft and extract a lot of these, uh, these points and polylines. That said, there are some bad methods of drafting. One thing that we don't like, importing an ortho photo directly into Civil 3D. Uh, not to Civil 3D too much, it does a lot, of good, uh, a lot of things really well. But Civil 3D, and in fact most CAD programs, can't handle really, really big files. You just can't do it. Computer will start, you know, coughing up smoke, and then it'll just say I'm tired and turn off. Um, or also dumb decimation of a point cloud. We, with everything I talked about earlier, there's so much effort that goes into getting good accuracy. Some people then take a point cloud and say, "Yeah, this is too big to work with," and just delete 95% of the points out of it so that it makes it a more manageable file size. Um, not a recommended procedure. You're throwing away all of this data that you've just spent so much time and money trying to. Uh, to make it look good. So what are some of the softwares? We don't really have an exactly recommended one. These are a list of the ones that you may have seen before. Um, we use most of them on different circumstances and different days, depending on the project. Uh, but these, there are just a lot of softwares out there, and all of them kind of do the same thing. You start with this huge amount of raw data, and you want to clean it up and reduce it into the data that you actually care about. Does this make sense when I'm talking about the, the concept of just reducing line, to reducing a big data set into useful data? All right, cool. So the last step, CAD finishing. So as we kind of already talked about, this is what a final survey should look like for us. That doesn't look anything like a raw drone photo. It doesn't look any. It doesn't look like a CAD program either. Or it doesn't. It's not a 3D model. It's not a point cloud. It's all cleanly annotated and it's sealed. So the first step to CAD drafting is to actually merge all of your data together. We've talked about this a couple of times. The drone data is great for a lot of things, and there's some stuff you still need to collect on the ground. Now, if you follow what I've already talked about with, uh, with setting the ground control point, all of this data should merge in perfectly. It should all be in the same data. It should all just, the instant you import your drone data, it all lines up perfectly in, uh, in whatever CAD software you're using, and everything should work together. That means your drone data, total points, break lines, paint striping, edge pavement, curves occasionally. I say occasionally because curve, curve lines can be picked up really well from 100 to 200 feet. If you're flying at 400 feet, you can typically get the back of the curve pretty well and like the edge of pavement, but the actual like gutter line is gonna be totally washed out if you're flying higher. Merging your field data, like I said, boundaries, building corners, monuments, ADA compliance, and obscured areas are all going to be merged together. Next up, use all that to just create a tin surface in CAD so that you have your uh, single surface that you can draw all of your contours on. Apply your custom layer templates. Um, every single client, as far as we've seen, has their own custom layers, everything from different colors, line thicknesses, that, styles, that sort of thing. Improve your visibility, changing font sizes, adding various you know, trees, culture. Adding in CAD-friendly imagery, that's another thing I mentioned. So, the raw files themselves for most photogrammetry are enormous, many, many gigabytes, and don't typically work in programs like Civil 3D. So there should be a CAD-friendly version uh, that is basically formatted so that it works in CAD software. It's easy to print, it's easy to use. Um, we've got a couple of custom algorithms that we use to actually make this specialty compressed uh, data that's really good for contextualizing, so that when you actually deliver a final survey, it always has imagery. 
you think that's actually one of the biggest benefits of this so that every single survey that you do, if it just has imagery underneath it, that provides a lot of value, a lot of value. Um, and that's kind of what gets you to this point so that the final survey should look exactly the same, whether it was made conventionally or from the ground. That's a big principle to us when we work with our surveyors and engineers. We don't think a drone survey is a thing because a survey is a thing. And what tools you use, that's usually up to you guys as the surveyors to pick what the right tool for the job is. All right, so putting it all together and creating a complete workflow. I've said this right at the beginning, and I'll say it now as we're getting closer to the end. Your drone program isn't saving time and money. It isn't working. You should start with your desired outputs. The biggest time killer that we see is, let's see what we can get out of it. Because I always say, can you imagine just saying, like, yeah, let's, let's give a crew some tools, send them to a site, and we'll see what they get back. But people do that with drones. They'll fly the drone and they'll say, like, yeah, we're experimenting. We want to see what we can do with the drone. What do you mean, what do you, can you do with the drone? You can fly around and do flips for all I care, but that's not going to help your drone program. So know what your desired outputs are. Go, before you go in the field, know if you're doing this for topo, or if you're doing it for utilities, or if you're just doing it for imagery to back everything up, or if you're doing it as just a CYA to have a second source of data for everything that you shot as well, so that you can prove that the first set of data that you got was right. Know what your goal is. All of those are perfectly acceptable uses for this, but know what the goal is and pick the right tool for the job. Total station has its place, GPS has its place, and drone has its place too. So here's kind of our workflow again, here's some of the, uh, the softwares that we use and everything. Another important part that I've uh, alluded to in all these steps is that you really should have quality insurance um, stepped in through every single, uh, every single step of this process, just to make sure that your data is of the highest quality. All right, so now it's kind of the fun part where I get to throw some of uh, our clients and former clients under the bus here. So this was a, um, a civil engineering firm that uh, were, had a couple of really, really smart guys. They worked on all sorts of big projects, you know, big like tech company, corporate campus, things like that. So they bought that drone up there. It's called a Micro Drones MD6 or something like that. I want to say it's about a $80,000 drone. Uh, or like 40,000, 50,000, something like that. They bought a $20,000 computer, this like custom built, like crazy, you know, server, Google level, whatever computer. And they bought all the nicest software, you know, probably $15,000, $20,000 worth of drone hardware. And then uh, about six months later, the whole project was canceled. They spent so much money up front and it was taking them so much time to do all of this. They actually submitted the data to us and were trying to get us to kind of like save their program because they were spending so much time on it. And it was really funny, they submitted the data and it was the best, it was the highest quality data, like raw data that our company has ever seen. And the program was canceled because they just were spending so much time on it. They weren't thinking at all about how do I save time with this. These were just guys that had an open checkbook, somehow got the right executive to sign off on their research project, and were just spending tons and tons and tons of money because they thought maybe they could get something really cool about it. Whereas a good workflow is someone that buys, you know, a couple thousand dollar drone, day one, you fly a site, you shoot your control ground survey, and you upload it to a company like ours, or you, you do it yourself if you got the right people, the second day, you do your photogrammetry, line work drafting, get your DWG files. The third day, then, you run your third day, run your checks, merge it in office, deliver it to the client, and your total upfront cost can be as low as three thousand bucks. You can spend about ten man hours per project. This isn't a pitch. I'm not trying to like sell. That's just what it actually takes if you really want to get started with drone survey. So that's kind of the way that it works. Um, so like what we do as a company, the reason we know all of this, we do offer line work is all of this stuff. We have people that actually, we have licensed photogrammetrists that map it all together. We work with a handful of people in this room and honestly all throughout Washington state. Um, we also do other things, everything from uh, selling ground control points and helping you with mission planning. So if you do have any questions, um, you can reach out to me or anyone at our company we actually really care about land surveyors and land surveying community, and that's why we come to talk like this, is because we support you guys as a community. We want to be there to make sure that we're not 
that kid that gives crap data and gives the whole technology a bad name. This technology is incredibly capable and we want to help make the most out of it. We want to save you guys a ton of time and, and a ton of money throughout the whole thing. So with that, I will open it up for questions in a second, but first feel free to send me an email. There's my email address right there. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff I can send you. From earlier on, I will give you a coupon code so that you can access all of our online training materials for free. Uh, I will send you a copy of these slides if there's anything that you want. And uh, I am actually recording myself on my lovely cell phone over there. So if you want uh, anyone else at your office to suffer through a couple hours of my voice droning on, you can share that as well. Um, we also have our checklists. We have accuracy standards. There's a whole lot of resources that I'm more than happy to give you guys. Uh, if you do want to get started and keep working on, uh, on starting a new drone program, or if you already have a drone, if you want to get more out of it, that's kind of what we're there for. Question, like Everything's open for us from FAA questions all the way through what hardware or can I fly on this interesting site. So with that, thank you for your time, and I will open things up to questions. I guess I've had it open. I was just curious, on your yeah. QAQC of the line work on proofing out on the ground, what kind of accuracy are you seeing on like the striping? So it depends on flight altitude is the number one thing. Uh, basically what we are seeing is generally when, when good practices are followed, we are seeing better than a tenth of a foot. X, Y, and Z. And again, tenth of a foot, when we talk about it, I mean that in the sense of root mean squared error, which is the statistical average of so yeah, tenth of a foot is what we're seeing on, on most uh, striping and hardscape, usually better. So for the processing line work, in your experience, if you, do you need an expert kind of doing that, you know, or somebody that's kind of dedicated to it? Like if you have David do it today and he gets promoted tomorrow, so if Jimmy comes in, I mean, I mean how hard is that to? No, that's, so that's, that's actually a really good, valuable question. Where do we go? Okay, here we are. So, if you remember, these are kind of the steps. It goes through photogrammetry, drafting, and then CAD finishing. Photogrammetry, you need an expert for that. Photogrammetry takes a long time. It's, a, it's very much a detailed science, and it needs an expert. Drafting, that does not take much training. That is, uh, that is a much more tedious, time-consuming, like, hey, draw the curves. You can sub that in, in and out pretty quick. Now there are some nuances, right? Getting all of your layers te templates right, making sure that you understand what to do when there's trees that are covering part of a curve. Can you interpolate a curve line under a curve? Do you mark it differently with something like that? How much tree coverage is too much before you interpolate and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure the curve just goes straight through there. There are some nuances, but that one has, the actual drafting phase, usually you can sub out people for one another because there isn't that much of a learning curve, um, as opposed to photogrammetry, that's a really long learning curve. Cat, cat finishing as well, then putting it all together in that final survey, that's another one that takes uh, a pretty long uh, learning curve, especially because, as, as was mentioned uh, by Bob earlier, you guys are the subject matter experts for all of your own regions. You know all of the like crazy, nuanced rules for the places where you work that are unique to that area, so you need to do that when you're putting all of your final data together. So typically the photogrammetry and CAD steps require someone that is pretty experienced in what they do. And the line work drafting is a lot more like, yeah, if someone goes on vacation, some are in and out, it's, it's a, a bit more entry level, I'd say. Yeah, so the answer is it's all done by autopilot now. So from a hardware standpoint, the drone flies, it's got um, four propellers that are spinning two and two clockwise, two counterclockwise, and it can stay relatively stable in the wind, but it also has what's called a camera gimbal. The camera is totally is separate from the drone and is uh, basically mounted on its own three axis gimbal that makes it so whenever the drone rolls pitch yaws, gets kicked by the wind like crazy, um, that camera stays rock steady, pointing straight down to manage motion blur. Um, and most drones keep it accurate to a tenth of a degree in terms of how much it will roll pitch or yaw. Now, 
That said, the drone does move in directions X, Y, and Z. The drone's flying when it goes. And that's kind of then on photogrammetry, that's why you need multiple photos. You're actually then comparing the photos to one another. And as you are doing the triangulation process, you're actually backing into the exact location of the drone when that photo was taken. So you combine all of those technologies together. That's all part of the, the photogrammetry stack. Um, but having that camera gimbal that keeps the drone, the camera steady even when the drone's moving around in the wind really helps with making sure that there's good, reliable data, even on windy days. Drones are getting better and better. You can, I mean, heck, you can fly in colder and snowier conditions than you ever have been before. Fog is still a pain because you have to be able to see the ground still. Rain is still a little bit of a safety issue with some drones, but uh, it's getting better that there are a lot of drones now that are even capable of flying in the rain and getting decent survey data. All right, yeah. How hard is it to get an FAA license? Not that hard. It's, uh, so like I said, at the beginning I was talking about the legal side. Shoot me an email, we'll give you the, all of the training courses. All you need to do is pass the test. And I highly recommend your videos. You really helped me. Thank you. I appreciate the, rec uh, the recommendation there. Now uh, we've, we've definitely helped um, across the country. I think we're almost at a thousand surveyors that, uh, that have taken our test and actually um, gone through a lot of our programs and are using this stuff. I got another question about that base. Yeah. You, you said for our six mile road project, we could do just one set up in the middle. Do you, remind me, do you guys have the, the, RTK the DJI the RTK base? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So what, what, what is the maximum range for that base? Then? Yeah, so specific to that technological kind of stack right there, I, I actually probably would wind up moving it once or twice. Okay. The way that that actually works is the, the base station talks to the, the transmitter with the tablet, and then that talks to the drone. So the limiting range is not the range of the base station, it's the connection so from the base station to the controller. That's where the limiting range is. And that I wouldn't go more than a mile. You could also post process it. You could also post process it. That's the other thing. And that's where you can use anything from a core space station, you can use to post process it to your own, you know, R10, like a GS16, something like that. That's the other, the other issue. But then it all depends, okay, if you're using a network, what's going to be the baseline distance? How far are you away from any sort of good uh, network base station? That's why it's the the RTK thing gets really complicated really quickly because um, you could post process it. I would probably set one or two extra control points and just bring the base with you. Then the DJI base with you. Have I done any work with bathymetric? Bathymetric, a little bit. Yes, bathymetric is bathymetric surveys with drones are highly specialized and require some really specialized uh, uh, hardware to be able to penetrate the water surface. The photogrammetry technology, unless your water is like, yeah, I mean really it's only accurate to a couple feet of depth or something like that, and special bathymetric capable drones are, again, you're looking at the $100,000 plus range easily. Yeah, when you're spending that much money, they put everything in the kitchen sink on that drone. <laughs> so yeah, there, there are bathymetric drones out there. I don't personally work with them, and they're very rare. Because again, it's one of those things that the cost gets so extravagantly high that it's cheaper to just send a guy out there on a boat. And that's gonna get you just as good, if not better data for a lot less than the, the half million dollar drone. <laughs> well, someone is getting a huge commission off that sale, and it's not me. <laughs> no, it's the technology's there. I get, I, there are actually there are a number of companies that are out there that like make these half million dollar equipment. And honestly, more often than not, the technology is great. It's amazing. Like, you're, if you're spending that much money, it better be amazing, and it is. I've worked with the half million dollar photogrammetry drones, and they are great. The tech not like the the data quality from it, it's like it's mind-blowingly good. And then you look at the price tag, and anyone with half a sense of business is like, wow, I could hire a lot of people for a half million dollars. <laughs> and if you see the half million dollar drone, it's like, and that doesn't even replace people because it's so complicated. I need a crew of four just to operate the half million dollar drone. So like the, the costs just go nuts. 
So, like, it's not that it's bad. So the half million dollar bathmetric drone, I've seen it in person, I have managed the data. Um, I know they only sell a few of those every, you know, every year. Uh, and from what I've seen, the data quality looks great. It looks perfectly fine. I can't knock on it because I, I haven't seen it, but it seems good. It's really the cost thing that's just the, that makes it such a pain. Then you gotta replace it in three years. <laughs> and just <laughs> straight into the dump. <laughs> yeah. All right, I will stay up here for a little bit to answer questions while we move into the next grade, but thank you guys all so much for the questions. Again, please do email me if I can go throw this back at the end. If you would like any of that information, we will get it to you.